Stephen Warner on the Barton organ with a little music from Vienna, uh, apropos to our visitor today. Uh, welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speakers Series. Today we present a provocateur whose work is known for illuminating the world's power structures, moving image artist Hito Steil. Uh, today's program is brought to you through a special partnership with the Becoming Digital Project and Conference uh, of the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. So a special welcome to any uh, Taubman folks uh, in the audience and any conference attendees. Uh, and for all the rest of you, a little word of explanation on Becoming Digital. Becoming Digital is a year-long project uh, that considers the deep changes that are underway in architecture and visual culture caused by the increasing naturalization of digital technology. Uh, over the course of this year, faculty and students at the Taubman College are debating, designing, and reflecting upon the current state of digital in architecture. The project includes workshops and invited practices that are critically engaged in digital technology through their work, a series of talks, an exhibition, and a conference, which is framed by three themes, image data, author user, and audience experience. Uh, Hito's talk here today, which addresses the conference themes, is actually the first keynote and the kickoff to the conference, which runs through February 3rd. So a hearty thank you to Becoming Digital and the Taubman College uh, for partnering on this, and of course to our regular series partner, Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Uh, I have two quick announcements for you today. We have an opening, actually opening today, not an opening reception, but just an, a soft opening is happening at the Institute for Humanities uh, of 72, which is an exhibition of mixed media work, fabric with digital imagery, embroidery, rhinestones, considering the Tivoli excursion in Kingston, Jamaica. This work happens to be the work of Jamaican artist Ebony Patterson, who we will welcome here to the Penny Stamp stage next Thursday. So, in the next week, you have the chance to go by and see the exhibition and see her work ahead of the talk. And if you don't, you can always join us. Next week, we will actually have a reception at the Institute following uh, her talk, Ebony's talk here. Uh, while you're out uh, and about looking at things in galleries, I highly recommend the Stamps Gallery uh, around the corner on Division. It currently is exhibiting work of a Detroit native, Susie Lake, now through February 25th, so you can take that in. Uh, Nicola's Books is in the lobby today with uh, some books by Hito Styro. Uh, and we will have a Q&A today, our regular Q&A, in the screening room. So directly following the talk here, please exit the theater, go left down the hall, and uh, meet us in the screening room. And you can ask Hito uh, deep and probing questions. Please do remember to silence your phones. And now, for a proper introduction of our guest, please welcome Assistant Professor of Architecture at Taubman College, Principal of TEAM, and co-producer of Becoming Digital, Ellie Abrams. Hi, good evening. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce tonight's guest, Hito Sterl. Hito is a filmmaker, a writer, a theorist, and a professor based in Berlin. Her work has been exhibited at the most prestigious art venues in the world, including the Venice Biennale, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, and the Museum of Modern Art, New York. This year, she was granted the number one spot on Art Review's Power 100 list, the first female artist to occupy such a position. A few of her many notable video and installation works include Factory of the Sun, which premiered in 2015 in the German Pavilion at the Venice Biennale and has since traveled the world, how Not to Be Seen, a fucking didactic educational.mov file, Hell Yeah, We Fuck Die, and Liquidity Inc., currently on view at the ICA in Boston. Hito is a prolific writer and theorist whose published essays and recorded lectures are passed around my informal network of architects, designers, and friends with an almost religious fervor. Her essay, In Defense of the Poor Image, published in EFLUX Journal in 2009, is part of contemporary architectural discourses canon, an instant classic shaping conversations among architects and their students everywhere. And this year, Duty Free Art, which is on sale in the lobby, a book of Hito's collected essays was published by Verso. These accolades aside, although they're impressive and important, Hito's presence here tonight is especially exciting to those of us at Taubman College who have been leading and participating in Becoming Digital. 
Tonight's lecture kicks off the Becoming Digital Conference, which continues next weekend with more lectures and panels. We cannot imagine a more fitting guest to launch the conference than Hito. If our ambition is to link the aesthetic and formal effects of the digital in our physical environment with the social and political repercussions of changing systems of creative and technical production, Hito's work is an aspirational model. She operates within contemporary structures of image and media to question those very structures and their underlying political and moral frameworks. Her work describes new subjectivities and paradigms of thought made possible by her commitment to destabilizing power structures in politics, art, and society. Her work reveals the ways in which everything around us is constantly being surveyed and policed from our faces to the ground beneath our feet. And yet, lest you despair at some dystopian view of the world, Hito offers us optimism and often humor. Her work is often described as disruptive, but this disruption always seems to be in the service of new relations between people and deeper understandings of the world, as it is, but also as we might want it to be. In her words, falling does not only mean falling apart, it can also mean a new certainty falling into place. Please join me welcoming Hito Sterl. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you also for the very generous introduction. So, um, as the introductions already stated, tonight I'm not going to talk about my work. Instead, I prepared a talk about virtual reality. Why virtual reality? Because I don't know what it is. I mean, it's more or less emerging as we speak. But still, I had the feeling that it's about time we start thinking about this new visual paradigm, which I call bubble vision. So let me just say one word before I start, because most of you don't know me. I'm not an academic, OK? <laughs> so this will not be an academic talk. I'm just warning you. <laughs> so you shouldn't believe everything I say. <laughs> But I have to say, I mean, to the best of my logic, uh, knowledge, everything I'm going to say is factual, yet the way things are combined may be a bit non-traditional every now and then. I will just, this is just a disclaimer, okay? <laughs> okay, so let me start with this painting. Actually, since a while ago, this is the most expensive painting of the world. It has been attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. It's called Salvato Mundi, was painted around 1500 and fetched the record price of 450 million at auction. Recently, it was bought by a Saudi prince and is supposed to be on display um, at the Louvre Abu Dhabi in the near future. I mean, there's a lot of interesting aspects uh, in that painting, but one of the most interesting ones for me was that even though the painting was made around 1500, it was sold within a post-war and contemporary art auction. Now, there's people who say that's mainly because 80% of the painting were painted within the last 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's very debatable. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to interfere in this debate. But I suggest, nevertheless, that we, con we definitely should treat it as a contemporary item, not necessarily because it has been made now, but because it has a special meaning today. So, first of all, it's price is very interesting, also doubts about its attribution. All of these make it a representative of an era that's racked by default fakeness, bubble markets, and financial speculation. But it also points at another aspect of contemporary visual technology, and I would suggest to look at the strange object which the Salvator Mundi holds in his hand, which is a crystal orb representing the world. And interestingly, 
these really look very similar to lenses of VR goggles. And this is what virtual reality and also 360 degree technology is defined um, through, basically by round lenses and spherical objects. And um, it's very interesting if you look at VR, for example, because one of the modes to travel from one scene to another in virtual reality, to teleport, so to speak, is to click on a sphere. And I would like to show you a video, which is right. basically a demo, hey, which was You're released a couple of weeks ago reality. by Mark You're Zuckerberg and his social um, VR. Our chief Rachel Franking, they demoed their new VR platform, Facebook Spaces. And let me just try to scroll to that, to that part. It's at 520. Oh, it's so tiny. Jesus. <laughs> Can you read it? It's so tiny. Four or four. Ah, sorry, 140. We have to go here. Really cool stuff that people are doing. Yes, okay. So from yeah, so here. The first place that we want to go today is, um, is Puerto Rico uh, to, to check out um, this, this interesting 360 video uh, that NPR took of, um, of what's going on down there. So let's, let's go quickly teleport there. All right, so now we are, we are in a 360 video. Um, in in Puerto Rico, uh, and on a second, and you can kind of get a sense of what is. We're on a bridge here. Um, it's it's flooded. Uh, you can you can get a sense of some of the the damage here that that hurricane uh, that the hurricanes have done, and um, I mean this is one of the things that's really magical about virtual reality is you can get the feeling that you're really in a place, right? I mean, it's, I, I probably should have mentioned this before, but Rachel and I actually aren't even, I think, in the same building in, in, uh, in, in the physical world here. But, totally I mean, different place we're here, I mean, it feels like we're in the same place and we're making eye contact, yeah, we're we talking could, to each we other. High yeah, there you go, high five. And, um, and you know, so now, you know, I mean, this is, we're, we're looking around and, uh, you know, it, you know, it feels like we're, we're really here in Puerto Rico where it's, um, yeah. you know, it's obviously a tough place to get to now and a lot of people are, are really suffering with the aftermath of the hurricanes. Um, this is an area that Facebook is, is very focused on, on trying to help out in the recovery effort. When, when the hurricanes first hit... Okay, so basically, you see what I mean? They are using these spheres, they call them transport orbs, to basically, you know, hop all over the place from their... Uh, company location in California to Puerto Rico later on they will even teleport to the moon and all the while they are doing it they are exclaiming crazy to feel like you're in the middle of it so it's about it's, it's, um, it's a feeling as if you actually inhabit a scene with your body you're basically able to teleport into a certain reality and to really experience it. This is the feeling that is being conveyed by this, this uh, demo video, let's put it like this. So the interesting thing is they will teleport off to the moon, but coming back to Salvator Mundi, we might also imagine that we actually clicked on that fear and inside there was this Facebook scene where they again clicked another bubble, another orb, and then teleported to wherever they wanted to go. And in my view, this scene shows uh, several things. I mean, given, you know, the, the, the background um, they used, basically the um, hurricane, um, the devastation um, left by the hurricane in Puerto Rico, um, one thing is clear that right now the world might need 
one or better many Salvatores Mundi saviors of the world in times of climate change and environmental, economical and political instability. That's one thing. But also it shows that one of the main characteristics of VR and 360 degree videos is something really paradoxical because in VR and also in 360 degree video, you are basically at the center of the scene. Everything revolves around you, you know, like a spherical universe, yet at the same time your body is usually missing from the scene. So you're both at the center, yet you are not there. Maybe if you're lucky you will have hands, you know, um, or, or a head sometimes, but your body is usually missing from the scene. Bodies become non-existent, they become transparent. So VR is basically where the non-existent bumps into the ubiquitous. And this kind of vision, as I said, is shaped by orbs, by spheres, by rounded lenses. One could call it bubble vision. So what's What's so interesting about bubbles nowadays? One could say that in the last decade, not only 360 degree panoramas, visual panoramas became a common sight in photography, video, and virtual reality, but in parallel also so-called filter bubbles on social media have been accused of nurturing division by creating parallel information universes. That's not, let's say, 100% confirmed according to, um, to, to research, but it can hardly be contested that bubbles as such have been an emblem of globalization, and they have figured a lot in art, but also, of course, in economies, so-called bubble economies shaped cycle after cycle of boom and bust affecting uh, real estate finance, of course, also the art market of the early 21st century. I was really uh, surprised to find this. This is an artwork by Jeff Koons, which sort of prefigures, you know, the authentication of the Leonardo da Vinci Salvator Mundi painting. This is a montage by Jeff Koons, which montages a Mona Lisa with, with what he calls a gazing ball, which is more or less an opportunity for people to see their own selfie within a painting. And there's also very serious artworks which deal with bubbles. This is an artwork called In the Air by Teresa Margolias, which creates soap bubbles, um, which are made with the water used to wash corpses in, corp in morgues in Mexico City. But all the bubbles that burst in recent decades didn't just vanish, but instead, I think, persisted. They exploded into a multitude of smaller bubbles. This here is something quite different. These are also bubbles. These are small air bubbles enclosed in what one could call ancient ice. Um, the drilling of ice cores is part of climate science. Uh, people drill into the Arctic ice to extract cores um, to establish some kind of archaeology of the human climate, because inside the ice, these ice bubbles contain atmospheres which may be centuries old. And in two of these ice cores, two scientists called Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin discovered some very, very intriguing effect. They found out that the biggest dip in carbon dioxide over the past 2,000 years was actually man-made, and it occurred already around 1610. And the theory they developed is called the orb hypothesis, the orb, again, for the globe, for the world. And they proposed 1610 as the starting point of the so-called Anthropocene. You see this strong dip, you know, which is happening around 1610. This is where carbon dioxide as evidence, you know, through those little bubbles enclosed in the ice cores, suddenly dips. And 
Um, so they suggest to name this or to call this, to divine, define this as the beginning of the so-called Anthropocene, what is this? A newly named geological era in which humans shape nature to a considerable degree, meaning they start controlling nature and shaping it uh, the way they want to. But around the same time, bubbles also become a popular trope in the so-called golden age of Dutch painting. So at that time, you see a lot of paintings which contain glass bubbles, um, soap bubbles, but also skulls. Um, they appear within a genre called vanitas. And vanitas loosely means the meaninglessness of earthly life, the transient uh, nature of vanity. And this genre coincides with a period of political uh, instability, religious division, also famine, for example, and an 80-year war of independence. And at the same time, both or colonialism fuels, so to speak, the emerging world trade, and at the same time, this also um, gives incentives for the creation of art. It fuels the art market. Vanitas paintings become attractive to a newly empowered merchant class, so they are more and more luxury properties, many of them tied, of course, to um, Dutch colonial plunder, but also trade, find their ways into the paintings, including colonial servants. And there are the bubbles again. At the same time, it is very cold also in the Netherlands. And this is, as the climate scientists argue, this is not a coincidence. Um, the so-called Little Ice Age may have been man-made, and that's what this dip in carbon dioxide suggests. Um, Maslin and Lewis interpret this dip in temperature as a direct consequence of the colonial invasion of the Americas, because they estimate that through this invasion around 15, 50 million original inhabitants were killed mostly through disease or through other consequences of colonialization. And all these 50 million people were missing and in the places they were living, slowly the vegetation grew back and of course captured and sequestered a lot of carbon dioxide. And both Lewis and Masley suggest to define this dip around 1610 as the beginning of the Anthropocene, because it's the first time that man-made activity, according to them, you know, I mean, there's also several, many, many other opinions to that topic. According to them, this is the beginning of, um, of the era where men, humans become central, you know, in shaping their own environment. In this era, man is supposed to be at the center of nature, just as we are users, are at the center of their 360 degree spheres. But in both cases, the human at the center may actually be missing. Jaron Lanier, um, he's a person um, who invented some of the first virtual reality equipment, I think already back in the 90s. He wrote recently that virtual reality is best thought of as the removal of a single human-shaped mass from the fabric of the universe. I think that's a really fascinating idea. So you have the whole universe and you basically eliminate one human from it and this is virtual reality. To build a universe in virtual reality, you need to mentally basically eliminate one single person from her surroundings, which means that this whole VR universe actually consists of people-shaped holes within bubbles. Of course, these kind of crystal orbs also have different uh, usages. Um, as crystal balls, for example, they are very popular 
um, objects or tools for prediction, magical prediction. In this case, whoever has seen the series knows that this doesn't work very well at all. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are trying to figure out, you know, what am I seeing in this sphere? And they think that the only thing that they could predict from this sphere is a foggy evening. And uh, so this is a very unreliable magic art in the Harry Potter series. But surprisingly, in the real world, people are much more confident about crystal balls. So this, some of these people you may know. The other ones is the uh, Egyptian president El Sisi, King Salman of Saudi Arabia. And to other people, they are opening an anti-extremist center in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. And thus they highlight the use of crystal ball style prediction in anti-terror activities. This is actually a so-called palantir, another form of crystal ball. It's actually a fictional item from the Lord of the Rings. And in this book, um, a palantir is a so-called seeing stone where you can see things happening far away. But palantir is also the name of one of the most important data analysis startups, which specializes in financial and security-based data analysis, um, actually founded by Peter Thiel. A Guardian report claims that Palantir, using the most sophisticated data mining, can predict the future seconds or years before it happens. So, I mean, the interesting thing about such statements is that they are completely unverifiable, but okay. So, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that today's crystal balls stand in for data-based prediction. Predictive analysis means to manage risk and, if possible, also preempt risk. And I would like to tap you know, into this palantir and teleport again into a fictional story. Um, if you remember, there's this very famous franchise, you know, consisting of uh, animation films, but also recently of Hollywood films, which is called Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell is a fictional narrative um, which is centered around a woman who is a cyborg, and she's a police cyborg, very su successful one too, but it turns out that actually she used to be a sort of anti-corporate militant who was preemptively killed and disappeared um, because she was trying to prevent the transformation of humankind into cyborgs. She was an anti-augmentation activist. And what happened? She got killed and <laughs> turned into a cyborg. So it's very interesting because this franchise, in this franchise, in this story, Ghost in the Shell, the ghosts of the Anthropocene, the missing and the disappeared, end up as rogue AIs and as cyborgs. In other words, in this tale, to be eliminated at the same time means to be automated. But to be automated also means to be eliminated. This is about architecture. This is an Amazon warehouse, which is automated to a quite considerable, considerable degree, populated by robots, but also workers and conveyor belts. Many people work there under quite questionable conditions. One reporter, which inserted himself into such kind of warehouse in the UK, <laughs> called his report his own story of how he became a human robot, and he talks to a worker who says, I expected it to be all modern and powered by robots in here, but now I understand why are we not allowed to sit, 
when it's quiet, we are human beings, not slaves. This is, so to speak, the other side of Amazon architecture. This is a rendering of the new headquarters of this company um, in Seattle. These are buildings called biospheres. You see it's a geodesic dome uh, kind of architecture. And um, this is a quote from a newspaper. When they open this year, I think they are about to open now, um, they will host more than 300 plant species from around the world, creating what the company sees as the workplace of the future. They will be, Amazonians will be able to break from their daily labors to walk, you know, in the forest and climb into little nests and so on where they could brainstorm and have meetings and perhaps even invent the next billion dollar opportunity. Of course, this building, like all Amazon buildings, uh, into the, this building only employees and those badged will be allowed in. So there will be, of course, gift shops by the entrance that will be open to the public. So I'm really fascinated by this juxtaposition of the two types of building, you know, Amazon buildings, because it seems to me that in this paradigm of what I call definitely in the case of the biosphere bubble architecture, the setting, which I described earlier on, of the Anthropocene has become inverted. If, as you know, the climate scientists argue, if the Anthropocene really started off with people missing in an Amazonian landscape, which was deserted and, um, and uh, basically cleansed of human life, now the situation has somehow become reversed and the Amazonian forest has become inserted, you know, into a bubble and preserved as a corporate headquarter, as a biosphere which is isolated from natural environments. An example of bubble architecture, there's an interesting precedent for some, this kind of architecture, which is the famous experiment Biosphere 2, which ran from 1991 to 1994. And in this experiment, two subsequent sets of, well, I think probably one could call them scientists, were locked into a greenhouse sphere in Arizona for several months and they had to be completely self-sustaining including not only the production of food but only uh, also their own atmosphere. They had to produce their own sustainable atmosphere. And interestingly this was um, thought of as a test for space colonization. Would people be able to live on Mars? Would they be able to produce oxygen? Would they, you know, get along with one another? Um, would they be able to produce food? And the answer is <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> the, the oxygen really, really dropped to very dangerous levels. The climate was quite toxic. Most mammals went extinct. Pollinating insects were wiped out. The crew, the crew fell apart into two hostile factions. And the only, or the species that turned out to be perfectly adapted to the oligarch space colony were cockroaches and ants. They thrived, you know, they loved it in there. I mean, for them it was, it was a ball for humans not so much. So you probably know by now because this is a very well-known story that the manager of this project was the former advisor to the US president Steve Bannon uh, whose management style prompted some kind of uprising um, at a certain point. He, was ta he staged some, si some kind of armed takeover of the promise premises because they weren't making enough profit. But the much more interesting thing, I think, that happened during that period is a much uh, less well-known um, consequence, namely that apparently reality as a format was invented as a consequence of the biosphere experiments. There was a producer in Holland called John de Mol who watched a satellite 
um, basically broadcast, you know, from within the biosphere, and then he came up with the idea to the format Big Brother, which means that actually reality TV as a sort of template, narrative template, seems also to have been bred inside the biosphere. And this narrative template is really interesting because it's based on an artificial idea of natural selection whereby the fittest, however this is defined, they survive or progress. And the biospheres are such, uh, are, um, as, uh, as are a perfect example of real life filter bubbles. Reality TV was basically designed within an environment of isolating people in survivalist environments. And in these environments, one could say that extinction was staged as a spectacle. And very interestingly, this comes very close to the initial meaning of the term virtual reality, because um, many people think that this term was co uh, coined at a certain point in the 90s, but this is not the case. This term, term was already coined in 1938 by a very unlikely person, namely the playwright Antonin Artaud, a French theater author, and he developed it in the context of what he called a theater of cruelty. What is the theater of cruelty? It was, in, Art, uh, in Artaud's view, uh, something which was a practice which, and this is a quote, wakes up nerves and hearts through which people experience immediate violent action, something that inspires through fiery magnetism and so on and so on. So he wanted to create a stage where overwhelming sounds and bright lights would sort of stun and shock the audience sensibilities and completely immerse them in theatrical experience. And this is what he called a theater of cruelty. And he defined that cruelty. He said this was not basically human cruelty in the sense of people, you know, trying to hurt one another. This was a sort of... Mm, sensual cruelty, and he very precisely named it as the cruelty which things can exercise against us. Is today the Amazon warehouse, is this a contemporary theater of cruelty where things create a chaotic cacophony? Of course, to link back to what I said earlier, the machines that are replacing humans in this warehouse and elsewhere are not literally the ghosts of disappeared people, like in the story, Ghost in the Shell. But maybe they prove something else. Maybe they prove that something else is disappearing, namely the idea of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, you remember, I told you a minute ago, this is the idea that we live in a geological area where humans are more or less in control of their surroundings and are shaping them at their will. So why should I say now it's over already? But I think at the same moment that humans became aware that they were supposedly all powerful and at the center of the universe, they are already busy trying to deflect that power and hand it over to opaque, automated procedures, to black box algorithms, to all sorts of machine intelligence, crystal ball gazing. People are handing over this power to systems which are just as invisible as the famous invisible hand. Is bubble vision, 360 degree spherical vision, is this a training scheme to adapt humans to a world from which they are increasingly missing because they are being replaced by invisible systems? 
are people rehearsing basically how to be their own ghost. But there is another possibility of interpreting bubble vision. Basically, if you look at the sphere of 360 degree technologies and VR and you know, see it as a crystal ball itself, the whole setup, what are you going to see? Does it predict a future in which humans are still at the center, yet not existent? Either be because humans have been automated, eliminated, or in trouble because of another man-made carbon dioxide crisis. At the end, I would like to teleport back to Leonardo and his orb. So what are we seeing in that orb? at the end. Is there anything one could learn from looking into that crystal sphere? And there is one very interesting mystery, you know, uh, in this orb, because as many art historians have pointed out, Leonardo painted the sphere in a physically incorrect way. Um, if it really was a crystal orb, then the interior of the orb would be represented upside down or at least, you know, severely distorted. In no way would the lines of the, of the um, dress uh, behind the orb be uninterrupted. And this is a real mystery because Leonardo was the person that probably knew most about optics, you know, of that period. He, you know, he, he even at that uh, point in time invented the, t the, or gave the technological foundations for inventing, how do you call it, contact lenses. So why would Leonardo paint the orb in such a way? And art historians actually have no answer for this. They don't know. I mean, some of them say, oh, he didn't want to, you know, um, destroy the composition. The others, others say, well, it's a spiritual painting, so he went, wanted to paint something supernatural. That's also possible. But what is it? And this is not a question I think I can answer, or anyone can answer. Maybe you can answer, and you can tell me later in the Q&A. So what is this orb? And I think there's at least two possibilities, and I will leave you with these two possibilities. The first possibility is that you see nothing in the crystal ball. This is what you see, basically, that there is nothing to see, not even your own reflection, which basically you should see optically. But the other possibility is that Leonardo really meant to show that, you know, whatever seems natural in, within this kind of spherical vision and this seems like a, let's say, obvious or not very surprising representation, may not be factual, you know? Just because it seems convincing, it doesn't mean that it's a fact. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.